What up, y'all? John Murray here, and I want to say thank you for tuning in to the YouTube playback of my Facebook Live series, Let's Talk Live. Now, because this version is not live, you won't be a part of the interactive conversation, so don't look for a shout-out. You won't be getting one. However, enjoy the Hot Topics dialogue and follow me on Facebook at John Murray World. That's J-A-W-N-M-U-R-R-A-Y World, so that you can catch a live broadcast and be a part of the conversation. Now, let's join Let's Talk Live, already in progress. And just, you know, um, all right, so, uh, unless you have been under a rock, or in what I like to call a soap opera coma, uh, last Wednesday, there was a meeting at uh, the White House uh, with uh, several prominent African-American preachers. Um, and I did the one thing I, uh, I forgot to pull up the preachers list tonight. Um, uh, let's see. Hold on one second, everybody. The full list is right here. I meant to print this out. But you know what? This is going to be an interactive experience on tonight. And, uh, all right. So, uh, we're going to talk about this. So, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to start with the general aspect. Uh, and then I'm going to, uh, deal with an individual aspect. And then I'm going to, uh, deal with the greater group again. All right? Uh, so, in attendance at the White House last Wednesday for this meeting that was said to be for prison reform uh, was Bishop Dale Bonner, uh, Bishop Kelvin Cabarrus, uh, Senior Pastor Choco Wilfredo de Jesus, uh, Pastor Michael E. Freeman, uh, Dr. Philip Goodall, Senior Pastor John Gray, Pastor Richard Hayes, uh, Bishop Daryl Lynn Hines, Senior Pastor Harry Jackson, uh, Dr. Alveda King, uh, Pastor Julian Damon Lowe, Dr. Van Moody, President, uh, President Willie G. Owens, uh, Senior Pastor Benny Perez, Pastor John Ponders, Pastor Darrell Scott, uh, Bishop Kyle Searcy, uh, and, uh, Senior Pastor, uh, Paula White Kane, and, uh, Marvin Winans Jr., also known as Coconut, not, uh, Marvin Winans, the pastor and member of the Winans group, but the son, uh, and I'm missing a name, oh, no, no, Pastor Julian DeMond Lowe from the Oasis Church, yeah, I have a few friends that go to that church, um, uh, they're changing their membership though. Um, so uh, before I get into the bigger issues here, I want to specifically deal with an issue that has become a breakout um, issue. Um, uh, and anything that I'm addressing that you have questions on, you need clarity on, uh, use the Google apparatus on your phone or on your computer. It works. Uh, Google. Uh, and it'll answer your questions. It'll find elements for you. I promise it'll all work out for your good. Um, so before I deal with the greater group, I want to uh, deal just specifically with uh, Pastor John Gray, because John Gray has been a standout scenario uh, from this dynamic. Uh, he's uh, had to address it multiple times and just want to deal with him first. So um, I genuinely, genuinely like Pastor John Gray. Um, John Gray is somebody who I've known uh, for uh, multiple years. Uh, I see him often at events, at functions, at gatherings. Um, uh, he's always been a cool brother, very pleasant. Uh, um, I followed some of his journey uh, and just really appreciated um, you know, things that were happening for him. Um, uh, I just saw John preach for the first time um, this past January in, um, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia at Isaac Curry's, uh, the plug conference. 
uh, it was a dynamic message. It really was impactful to uh, the participants there. And um, at his core, I believe John Gray is a wonderful human being, a great dude. Um, and unfortunately, in this particular dynamic, it is my opinion that he's become guilty uh, by association. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of people who are specifically attacking John Gray, and and I believe there's a the, there's a reason for that. Um, the reason that I think John Gray has become a target uh, in this situation is because he was the most prominent individual uh, in that room. John Gray was set by uh, Donald Trump for a reason. Uh, John Gray was serviced to the public, to the media, to the Christian community, and photos next to Don, uh, Donald Trump by this administration for a reason. He was the most visible. Uh, he comes out of the Joel Osteen church. He now pastors his own church, Relentless Church in South Carolina, and uh, he has a show on the OWN Network. He's been interviewed by Oprah. He has a New York Times best-selling book. He is a great guy with a positive message who really has a heart for God. And at my core, I believe that John Gray uh, meant no harm. And being there at the White House, he really thought that he was there for a greater good, for a bigger purpose. But there is a lesson that all of us can learn for what happened to John Gray. Now, John Gray aside, there are some people who were at that table, who were in that room, who signed up to go to that White House, ready, willing, and able. Uh, they fawned over Donald Trump. Um, I mean, uh, the only thing they could have done in addition to all of that brown nosing and tail kissing that some of the people at the table did uh, was pull out a bowl and some water and humble themselves by washing their feet. If you don't understand the context there, uh, go to church, go to Bible school, or use the Google apparatus on your phone. Um, and so when I saw initially um, that this had transpired last Wednesday, I was packing and running errands and getting ready to go to Detroit for the National Association of Black Journalists Conference. I've been off the road for three weeks. When I don't travel consecutively, I lose my mojo. I have to get a rhythm back. And so I had become so consumed by this thing. My phone was ringing like a Jerry Lewis telethon. Every black social justice, civil rights leader and you know black preachers and just smart people who watch the news were calling me and engaging. And so I wanted to be very intentional about what I said and how I said it because at least one of the people at the table, uh, I knew John Gray was a good brother who was going to take a hit as a result of what I believe to be a bad decision. And so I wrote something that I wanted to share on social media and I kept it in my phone for three hours before I posted it. See, some of us can be so impulsive that we post things on social media immediately. I've done that before. I've learned by trial and fire. And so uh, I decided to write how I felt and what my thoughts were. Uh, and I let it sit in my phone for three hours before I shared uh, the message publicly. And for those who may have missed it on Instagram or here or on Twitter or any other platform, I, I started it out because as we were dealing with scripture I and mean, with preachers, why not start with the scripture? And, and so the text for my, while well, I sound a little preachy all of a sudden, but the text for my social media message uh, was from the book of Proverbs the second chapter, the 12th and the 14th verse, and it said, Wisdom will protect you from evil schemes and from those liars who turn from doing good to live in the darkness. Most of all, they enjoy being mean. And I don't know about you, but anybody who watches the news or remotely follows politics sounds like whoever helped write this particular passage in the book of Proverbs uh, knew that Donald Trump may one day be president of the United States. And so I continued in my writing. Why do I sound so preachy on tonight? This is going to be a fun show. Uh, every seat at the table ain't a good one. 
And thanks to the African-American preachers who declined being exploited by those false prophets, Paula White and Daryl Scott. Let me, I think I want to say that part one more time. Thank you to the African-American preachers who declined being exploited by those false prophets, Paula White and Daryl Scott, and opted against the White House photo opt disguised as a meeting on criminal justice reform. Um, I wish I had one of those readers like they do in the Pentecostal church where somebody was reading from the sidelines while I was filling in the blanks. But the text continues. Uh, I watched the live stream and seeing how several prominent preachers, not all, but several prominent preachers, a few that I used to respect, because while John Gray may have been the most prominent at the table, there are other people who I, that I'm aware of, that, that I've experienced, that I'm familiar with. But, uh, uh, and so some of them fawned over the man in the White House, so I've lost respect for them. So I watched the live stream and seeing how several prominent preachers, a few that I used to respect, sat there and fawned over this man despite his consistent racism and bigotry towards people of color. It was an embarrassment. Uh, one pastor said, you have an ear to hear from God. I, those words just, they, they said chills up my back when he said it because I said, sir, you might be in reprobate mind. He said, you have an ear to hear from God. I never knew God downloaded messages of vulgarity and hateful bigotry, racism, sexism, and all the other deplorable things that Trump has said and done. But what I do know is if my pastor had been sitting in that room, I'd be seeking new membership and seeking new covering. What I witnessed today was reprobate. And if you don't know what reprobate means and what it means about the mind, look it up. Use that Google apparatus on your phone. That's going to be the theme of the night, the Google apparatus. What I witnessed today was reprobate, and I was embarrassed to be a black Christian. At the crux of what's happening here, um, uh, and for anybody who's just signing on late and who's missed the, the beginning of this, go back and watch it from the beginning. Um, you know, I've been clear, I've been concise, I've been uh, very intentional in, in, in my words and in my thoughts about uh, Pastor John Gray. Uh, I'm going to say it one more time uh, because I want, I want to make impact on what I'm saying. John Gray is a good dude with a good heart who really is sincere about his plight for ministry and helping and encouraging people. I, be I believe that at my core, uh, but like I said, every seat at a table ain't a good one. And when you have a seat at the table, if you can't make influence, what was the purpose for the seat? See, I have friends that if I invite them out to dinner, uh, if they are vegans, they go to the restaurant's website and look at the menu in advance because they want to make sure there's something on the menu that they can eat, that they'll be able to digest. I have friends who are vegetarian and they won't go out to eat at a restaurant that does not have an offering for them. And God forbid if you have a gluten situation. Ah, touch a, turn to your neighbor and say gluten situation. If you have a gluten situation, you might not be able to physically digest things on a menu if it's not prepared with that in mind and so we can't be more intentional intentional about where we dine and how we dine than we are when we sit in a situation that has great impact you know um i'm of the nature that i won't go out to eat with a group of friends if i don't know who's coming because depending on who's going to be there depends on how free I can be with my friends. See, there are times when my friends have brought around folks who have seen John Murray, the TV personality, John Murray, the social media personality, John Murray, the former full-time entertainment journalist, and they read my articles, I'm familiar with my journey. And so they have an impression of me that may not be in line with who I am as a human being as a good guy, as, a, as somebody who 
just wants to be around my friends, who doesn't want to have to talk industry, who doesn't want to have to be on and be guarded. And so there's certain times where I ask my friends, who's going to be at the table? Because I want to come and talk to my friends. I want to talk and be free. And so the fact that I'm more conscientious about who I break bread with than certain people are about big influential moments is concerning. Um, at my core, I believe that John Gray was taken advantage of. I believe that uh, Prophetess, and I spell that P-R-O-F-I-T-E-S-S -S, because she's all about making profit. Uh, Paula White and that lying, admitted liar, the man who said he met with Chicago gang thugs, admitted liar Daryl Scott, who if somebody, I got $20 for somebody who can show me a picture of him preaching on a Sunday morning in a congregation with a full church. Because there's a lot of these pre preachers around Donald Trump who we haven't seen any evidence of their work. Uh, there's no... There's no bearing of your fruit, um, and there are no pictures of your congregation. So can somebody, anybody, show me um, the evidence of uh, Daryl Scott actually being a pastor or a preacher? Um, uh, but I think that these guys, with the help, um, as one of the preachers admitted, unfortunately, of uh, Marvin Coconut Winings inviting these preachers to the White House, they knew that if they could get a John Gray there, um, it was going to be the jackpot for them. And so that's why he was set next to Donald Trump. Uh, that's why he's been exploited in the photos. That's why he's taken the biggest hit. I believe that he was taken advantage of uh, because, like I said, at his core, I know he's a great guy. Um, but part of the challenge in not understanding the impact of this particular meeting and while if you're not equipped for the call, you may not should answer, um, is that the black community has been very specific to people who decided to go to this White House or to Trump Tower. I mean, we've seen the fallout with Steve Harvey. We've seen the fallout uh, with Ray Lewis. We've seen the fallout with Tina Campbell. You saw the fallout with Chrisette Michelle uh, at inauguration. We've seen the fallout where black people have said this man is doing so much to stand against our community. He is um, taking back things that impact our community. They are in direct opposition of civil rights, of affirmative action, of social justice. I mean, the things that are happening to black people in the NFL. Listen, I don't have to detail the things that the Trump administration have done that are clearly anti-black. Uh, there's a great letter that I posted on my Facebook page over the weekend that a collective of 50 plus pastors have signed that really break down all of the nuances in that situation. But at the core of what's happening right now is this dynamic where there's culture versus crowd. What are you saying, John? Am I acting like a preacher again? I think so. Well, what I'm saying is that there is this notion among evangelicals where they're telling prominent black leaders and preachers and worship leaders that you have to choose your faith over your culture. They are telling them that you have to deny who you are as a human and serve Christ first. And I don't know about you, but that's a bad way of thinking. Well, what do you mean, John? Shouldn't it be about God first? What I know is this. In this culture, in this climate, in this world, if a police pulls you over and decides they want to racially profile you, they don't ask you, do you know Jesus? What they want to ask you is, uh, uh, are you a black man? Do you have a gun in your car? Where are the drugs? You might end up being shot because of the color of your skin, not because of the Christ who you follow. And the reality is that we saw out in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the gentleman who uh, was uh, like a minister at the church, he sang in the choir, a good brother who the police randomly shot, and then you could hear the woman on the police dispatch saying, he looks like a bad man. They didn't care that he knew Jesus, they just knew that he was black, and they targeted him. And so, 
you know, the challenge in this climate is that you have black preachers and singers and leaders who wear foolish t-shirts that say things like, not black, not white, but Christian, but human. No, you are black. And the moment you stop realizing that you're a black man who happens to be a Christian, you're in for an inward wake up call. That's what Paul Mooney says on stage, and that's one of the few times where I think that word is appropriate. So here's the thing. We've got to love ourselves first. We've got to love our community. Because what happens is, if you alienate your core, you don't have anybody to fall back on. You know, Lecrae is a great example of, uh, he was a Christian rapper who became highly successful because white Christians were buying his CDs in droves. Uh, Lecrae was selling records independently that people were not even selling at major labels, so the major labels came after him. He was playing huge venues, thousands of people coming to hear Lecrae uh, perform because the white Christian audience is more into the Christian hip hop than black people uh, are, you know, black people are very funny about how they consume their Christian messaging. But the moment Lecrae started tweeting Black Lives Matter and started advocating for social justice and civil rights, the white Christian community was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. you're a Christian. How dare you champion Black Lives Matter? How dare you stand up for your community? How dare you root for your race? You stand with us. We don't see race and you shouldn't either. No, you don't see race when it's convenient for you. But it's obvious with these evangelicals who are supporting this bigot, this demigod, this sexist, awful, uh, Islamophobic man who has occupied the White House with the help of Russia, that you do see race. And so for the um, uh, Vicky Yohees and the Paula Whites and uh, the Martha Menizzi's and all these white people who came and exploited the black community for their own personal wealth and self-aggrandizement, uh, who built money off of our community, but then they supported this man because they hated the idea that a black man was in the White House and he wasn't their slave. And so all of a sudden during the election, they start saying, well, Jesus is headed back to the White House with Trump. Well, if Trump is the embodiment of Jesus, what type of God have we been serving? Because that man has a demonic spirit in him. Everything he does is awful. And he hates the sound, the sight, the idea of smart, accomplished, successful people of color. The, here's the thing. I can't go to a dinner table and hear somebody talk about one of my friends and say something incorrect without me checking them. Hey, hey, hey boss. That's not right, yo. That's, that's not. Yeah, you saying a whole lot. But I can't let you get away with that because that's inaccurate. You're not going to come and be in my presence and disrespect my friends, disrespect my family. Um, and the truth is, anybody who really knows me will tell you, you can come around and talk about one of my enemies and be factually inaccurate. And I'm going to check you on that too. Because I'm a person who believes in facts and figures and actuality. So if the first thing I'm going to not do is, if you invite me to the White House and I think I'm coming for actual change, I'm not going to sign a waiver that says I can't ask you a question while I'm in the room. I don't care if I bought my ticket. I don't care if I paid my own hotel room. I don't care what aspects of sacrifice I've made to come to this meeting. The moment you tell me that I can't ask this man a question, I then realize I'm there for a photo op. I'm not going. You won't be using me as a pawn. But unfortunately, that's exactly what transpired in this situation. And these people did not decide, I don't want to be there. Because some of them actually wanted to be there because they actually support the ideology of this bigoted man, Donald Trump. They're into the manipulation of black people for their own gain and worth. Because some of them are your pastors and they've been manipulating you for years. Huh? I can't get no amen right there. Oh, y'all don't like this type of teaching. But it's the truth. And so, you know, if I'm going to be at a table, I'm going to influence that table. If I'm going to be at a table, I'm going to make impact. If I'm going to be at a table, when you say something that's incorrect, I'm going to check it. So when you have a, a 
Pastor Daryl Scott say that Donald Trump may be the most pro-black president of all times. I'm a, I'm going to cough. I'm going <coughs> Listen, I'm going to say something cuz here's this, this is what I know to be true. I'd rather check somebody like him and have Secret Service drag my ass out the White House than sit there at the table and act like I'm cool with everything that's transpired. The Bible says don't let your good be evil spoken of. So you said you were going there for good, but there's all this evil around you and you're in the mix of it. And now you're guilty by association. So you got to be conscientious of where you go. And when you get there, you got to make an impact. I'm never going to go sit in front of a bigot and not tell him he's won. And here's the thing. The other thing that will never happen is you're going, if you ask me to pray, I'm never going to pray Lord, let your hand, let his hands be blessed and let everything he touched be blessed. Well, you just prayed a curse over your community because everything that he's touched has been anti your community, anti your race, anti your culture. This man has done more to harm black people in his two and a half, off, two and a half years that he's been, or oh, is a year and a half, however long this clown has been in the White House, he's done more to set us back as a culture than anybody has done in recent times. And you sat there, and I'm talking about the collective, not about one individual. These people sat there and let this clown, Darrell Scott, say he might be the most pro-black pastor of all times. Well, do you not remember the things, the acts, the legislation that uh, uh, President Lyndon Johnson signed to advance black people? Do you not re realize the things that uh, President Jimmy Carter did to impact and advance black people? And I know people have issues with the fact that there was some prison reform legislation that happened during his tenure, but I was old enough to know black people wasn't struggling financially the way they were when Bill Clinton was at the White House. But nobody said nothing, nobody had an itch, nobody had a tick, nobody coughed, nobody spilled a glass of water, nobody said, clown, you might be getting carried away. No, you sat there and y'all smiled and y'all fawned and y'all looked like fools. Even Kim Kardashian went to the White House with an intent and she did not smile for the cameras. She did not fawn over this man, and at least when she left, there was a tangible result. A woman left prison. And so, yes, people can post these very vague, not so factual stories from the hill on their timeline and say, Trump gives a thumbs up to the criminal justice reform. I'm sorry. If that's what you believed happened as a result of this meeting, then you also show that you don't have the knowledge of politics and, and did not have the capacity to be there. Because uh, Political Science 101 will teach you how um, a bill becomes law, and it don't happen from a meeting. Uh, Jared Kushner has been working on prison reform the entire time He's in the White House, and he partnered up recently with Van Jones from CNN, and they worked on a bill that Trump had already said he was giving a thumbs up to. So that whole thing on Wednesday, again, was just a photo op. Let me tell you what, where the great lesson could have been in all of this, because at, at its core, you guys understand the gist of, of what I'm saying. Um, in life, sometimes you make a mistake. I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. We all made mistakes. And some mistakes can be the greatest teaching tool a person can ever experience. If I go through something and it impacts me greatly, uh, you can learn from my mistakes. I don't necessarily have to, uh, or you don't necessarily have to go through what I went through uh, just to say you too learned that same thing. And so in a situation like this uh, where I believe, my belief is that John Gray uh, was taken advantage of, that was, was you know, he was really uh, used as a pawn in a bad situation. And John almost admitted it on CNN, but he wouldn't allow himself to concede to the error. Um, um, is people would move on 
and forgive, particularly those who identify as Christian and who are church going, they would have moved on and forgiven most of the preachers who said that they were there and had, uh, and maybe it was a mistake. All some of these guys had to do was come out and say, you know, in this situation, I believe God called me to go to the White House, but sometimes you miss God. And I know things look bad, but I made a mistake. And as somebody who recognizes that people can learn from my mistakes, this is not something I would have ever done again because I am a person who is for my community. I advocate for my community. And uh, I want other people to learn from the mistake that I made. That would have been a master class in Christian compassion and forgiveness. And if my leader can't acknowledge that sometimes even he makes a mistake, that's a problem for me. And so, not to belabor the moment, as most preachers say when they're trying to conclude their message, we live in uh, very dangerous times. And folks are fighting for their lives. You know, on a daily basis, number 45 is attacking people like LeBron James for creating schools to educate inner city students so that they won't be statistics and they have a better chance. And be able to uh, achieve greater than he did. He's attacking people like Congresswoman Maxine Waters because she stands in opposition of his hatred and his bigotry and all the awful things that he does. He stands in opposition against people like my friend, White House reporter April Ryan, because she asks questions that keeps this administration accountable and brings truth to power. He stands in opposition of people like Don Lemon. And I could list a laundry list of black people from Congresswoman Frederica Whitfield on down. But Donald Trump has not met with the Congressional Black Caucus. Donald Trump does not meet with civil rights leaders. Donald Trump has not met with black scholars. Donald Trump has not met with anybody that can hold him accountable for his lack of of understanding on government, on community, on social issues, and civil rights. And he has not met with these people because he does not care. And so anybody who goes to this White House thinking they're going to be the one to impact him, my presence is going to change the atmosphere, my prayer is going to make him a better person, you did not hear from God. You have a God complex. You think you're the Messiah, and that you're the one that's going to change it all. But the truth is, if you also believe the one that invited you, oh, improper Paula White is truly a woman of God, well, why hasn't her presence changed him? Because he doesn't want to change. So I challenge anybody who is a member of a church where one of these people and I think it may be time for a roll call yet again. Uh, Bishop Dale Bonner, Bishop Kelvin uh, Cabarrus, uh, Senior Pastor Choco uh, Winifro de Jesus, uh, Pastor Michael E. Freeman, Dr. Philip Goodall, uh, Pastor Richard Haynes, uh, Pastor Daryl Hines, Pastor Larry, Harry Jackson, Dr. Alveda King. Can somebody provide us proof of her doctorate? Because folks running around here using honorary doctors and acting like they're real. Uh, Pastor Julian DeMond Lowe of Oasis Church. And my friends are leaving your church. I've already talked to them. Dr. Van Moody. Uh, President Willie G. Owens. It don't even look like he got a church. Pastor uh, Benny Perez. And Pastor John Ponders. Uh, ain't nobody going to Daryl Scott's church. And Bishop Kyle Searcy, uh, black people are already leaving Paula White's church in droves. Her, her son did an interview. He admitted it. Uh, and Marvin Coconut Winans don't have a church. If you are a member of a church and your pastor has not acknowledged the error in their ways, if your pastor has not acknowledged that being there was a mistake and, uh, and took ownership of that, uh, <clears throat> And if you watch the ABC news feed, uh, the video, the 28 minute meeting in the photo op, where the preacher sat around and did introductions and half of the people there fawned all over 
the ministers, if if your pastor was somebody in that room and was fawning all over the ministers, it's time for you to go from that church. You are being subjected to poor leadership. You are being served bad food. And if you were at a hospital and you heard that the doctor consistently performed malpractice, you would go find yourself another doctor. And so it's time for you to find a new doctor because your soul, your spirit, your faith is precious cargo and you can't have nobody doing surgery that's not equipped to operate on it. So uh, I love you guys. Um, you know, it's unfortunate living in this climate where there is uh, the conflict of culture uh, and crowds of evangelical versus Black Lives Matter, of destruction versus survival. Um, but we've got to hold each other up. We've got to hold people accountable. And anybody who says that the Christian way is just to pray about it is a fool. Because during the times of slavery, slave masters uh, uh, didn't want black people to learn to read and write and ask questions. Because if you didn't have knowledge, you couldn't figure a way out of your circumstance. And the reality is that slaves also prayed. And they also loved God just before they were hung and lynched and raped and murdered and called nigger. So again, I say to you, uh, you know, uh, I feel bad for John Gray. Um, I know he's a good guy. I feel like he made a bad decision. I think he'll grow from it. And I think he'll be fine in the long scheme of things. I think he was taken advantage of by some duplicited, manipulating, evil people who have exploited their faith for financial gain with number 45. Um, I personally would like, you know, to see John stop responding to people on social media and stop his wife from just carrying on because it's not making the situation worse. Because this is what I know to be true. If God gave you vision... He'll give you provision to go through your storm. If God told you to go, then why isn't God giving you the means to take your lashes? And if God gave me a vision, I'm not online. I'm not on a media tour. I'm not out here arguing or debating with anybody uh, that that was my purpose and that God told me to be there. Uh, um, you know, I, it, 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 it makes... It makes it hard to advocate for somebody when they stand in their pulpit on a Wednesday night and say, I'm addressing this one time and one time only. Um, I'm not Democrat. I'm not Republican. I'm Christian. Um, the media has been calling and I've turned down every interview. Um, so I'm going to say it tonight and that's the last you'll hear about it. And then less than 24 hours, you're sitting on television with Don Lemon trying your best to explain it. In a, and with, in my humble opinion, was a not so successful interview. And when Don Lemon also made a parallel about slavery, um, it just, it showed the flaws in the situation. So, you know, again, sometimes humble is the way. And if you can humble yourself, and this isn't about just John, but about anybody else who recognizes that them being there and that situation was an error. Uh, if you realize you made a mistake, just tell the people that. Yes, I believed God called me to go, but sometimes I miss God. And uh, it's the greatest lesson in Christian compassion we can teach people. So I thank you guys for checking in with me on a Sunday night. Uh, our numbers were really strong. I hope I left an impact on you. And listen. You know, um, who am I to say that um, my way is the only way? Never would I be that arrogant to uh, 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 believe that my point of view is the only point of view. I can only tell you what I know and, and what I believe in my heart of hearts. And so um, I pray that maybe something I said will help lend a little compassion uh, towards how some of you feel about John Gray. Um, but I also... Uh, pray that what I said will make some of you guys realize that you're in a bad place with some of these other preachers and you need to get the hell up out their house because what they serving you ain't good um, 
And that's it. I've said enough. I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. And uh, we'll talk again real soon, all right?